Hello everyone. Um, this lecture um, deals with the end of reconstruction um, and the viewpoints, uh, historical viewpoints um, on how reconstruction was handled. So um, we're going to jump straight into this. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get after it. Um, so the end of reconstruction. The end of reconstruction, um, it's complicated. So reconstruction ends um, with the election of 1876, um, and we're going to talk about why it has to end on an election year for the presidency. Um, so post-Civil War South, um, the KKK is founded. Um, sorry. So the KKK is founded, um, and its first leader is former Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, and they use violence and intimidation to suppress um, former slaves from voting and from using the new rights granted to them under the uh, new amendments to the Constitution. Um, then we have this idea of redemption. So the democratic redemption of the South, um, this idea of the lost cause of the Confederacy, um, the Bourbon Democrats, the White League in Louisiana, and the Red Shirts in Mississippi and North Carolina. Um, these concepts or ideas or groups um, believed in the redemption of the Southern cause um, that was fought for in the American Civil War. Um, Seward's folly. So William Seward was the Secretary of State under president under both presidents Abraham Lincoln um, and Andrew Johnson after Lincoln's assassination. And Seward, while Reconstruction is happening, decides to negotiate with Russia to buy Alaska. So if you ever wonder why we've got this random territory just up next to uh, Canada, um, Seward is your guy. So uh, Seward, um, so Russia, so okay, wow. Um, so we have colonization, right? And we know that the British colonizes North America along with the French and the Spanish. But what we do neglect to mention is Russia colonizes Alaska. Um, and Seward buys um, Alaska um, in 1867 for $7.2 million, so two cents an acre, um, for the hope of resources in that region. And today, Alaska has proven to have massive amounts of natural resources for the United States. Also, could you just imagine, like, during the Cold War, Russia just, like, owning Alaska? Really, really becomes pretty complicated when you think about it that way. So this is how we get Alaska. Um, this decision arose from the Grant administration's effort to punish, coal f the, punish the coal flax massacre in Louisiana, which was a clash between the white leaguers and freedmen loyal to the government on Easter Sunday in 1876. 73 right, white people were indicted, nine were tried, three convicted, which was then overturned by the United States Supreme Court. Um, this is, this decision is, it, it's basically that the 14th Amendment applied to a state action, not an individual citizen. So you can't use amendments to push onto regular, like individual people, but only to a state. Um, so 150 black people were killed during this Colfax riot or arguably the massacre. Um, it was on April 13th of 18673, and it marked the end of carpetbagging misrule in the South. Um, if you don't remember in the last lecture, we talked about carpetbaggers or people that came from the north and moved south. So it's a big deal. Um, in the U.S. v. Rees, which is in the uh, uh, United States Supreme Court, the African, an African-American man in Kentucky was not allowed to vote. Um, and the court held that the 15th Amendment, which granted um, African-Americans the right to vote, did not actually give this to anybody, but it only listed the grounds on which it couldn't be denied to them. So it basically said, okay, here's your voting rights, but here's a list of like things that the state can say that like can't stop you from voting. So this leads for poll taxes, literacy tests, and grandfather clauses in Southern states. So because the U.S. Supreme Court is not willing to clarify directly what these amendments mean to the people, um, there's other laws that states come up with that circumvent um, the 15th Amendment. Um, poll taxes are like when you would go to, to vote, you had to literally pay a tax to vote. Literacy tests, was, they would literally test you at the polling place to see if you could read, and if you couldn't read, you weren't allowed to vote. It's, it's intense. 
Um, so then we have the Compromise of 1877, um, which followed a disputed election of 1876 between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden. The disputed votes were in Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. The commission of five senators, five representatives, and five Supreme Court justices voted eight to seven to certify the returns given the election to Hayes. This is complicated. None of that is actually in the United States Constitution for how to deal with an election. In exchange for the Democratic acceptance of this election, the Republicans were to remove federal troops from the South. This has a huge impact, thus ends Reconstruction. So the Democrats actually, they, they think that they won because Reconstruction isn't halted, like literally dead, dead, like done. When Rutherford B. Hayes takes the oath of office, he removes all troops from the South. So in other words, Reconstruction was on the chopping block for him to become president of the United States. And he chose to become the president over ending Reconstruction. So this is Rutherford B. Hayes and this is Samuel Tilden. Here's the compromise of 1877. It was literally nobody got it was 50% of the electoral vote to both sides. Nobody won the election. Um, this is like a political cartoon of robbing the, of, of basically Hayes robbing the election. Um, and here's another one. So this is the president's, this little thing here represents the presidency and you've got Hayes taking it from Tilden. So this is the legacy of reconstruction. It, there's huge resentment towards the North from the South. The South hates the people in the North. This is where we get the term the Yankees. Um, there's no clear plan for continued reconstruction. 1876, it just, it's, it's over. They just rip it away. Um, so it's considered a failure. Um, only temporary benefits to blacks in the South and moderates didn't understand the protection needed for black rights. They didn't get that these people needed more protection. They thought that the amendments were enough. Um, there's deep racism and indifference to the plight of blacks in the South. Um, in the early 1900s, William A. Dunning, Reconstruction was a national, national um, he's a filmmaker, right? And he makes this film called Birth of a Na Nation because he believes that Reconstruction was a national disgrace and absolutely a failure. There's too many rights for African-Americans too soon. They weren't ready for this, this power granted to them. And the rationale for the early 20th century racial segregation comes up with the film the birth of a nation uh, made by D.W. Griffin. Um, it is actually shown, it is the first movie to be shown in, um, in the White House under President uh, Woodrow Wilson. And it's extremely important to note that um, the birth of a nation literally is like the beginning of like these conceptions um, of black people in the United States. Um, if you, Feel the need to watch this film. It's actually all on YouTube for free. Um, it's pretty intense. Uh, it's a silent picture, but it, the, the movements within the movie are, are just enough to make you go, wow, that's crazy. Um, in the 1930s, John Hope Franklin and W.E.B. Du Bois um, highlighted the achievements of Reconstruction governments and Black leaders within them. I've been added to by Kenneth Stamp, post-World War II said that Reconstruction was a noble experiment, but it ultimately failed. It wasn't executed all the way and properly. Um, in the 1970s, Michael Benedict and Leon Litwack um, scrutinized the motives of Northern politicians after the American Civil War. In the 1980s, some historians have criticized Congress for not being radical enough and not prolonging the military occupation of the South. In other words, just giving in in the 1876 election um, and just ending Reconstruction. Eric Foner, um, who's a very famous historian even today, um, acknowledged the limits of Reconstruction and pointed out that Freedmen established many long-lasting institutions in African-American communities and took a second Reconstruction, quote unquote, after World War II with the Civil Rights Movement to recognize the promise of the first Reconstruction. So this is really interesting. So Eric Foner says that like there's two Reconstructions. The first one is the one we've talked about in the 18 at the end at the end of the American Civil War. The second one is in the 1960s with the Civil Rights Movement, and it took the first one to realize what was needed to fix when we had the second one. Um, that's a very important uh, point to note. The 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment provide the basis for the civil rights le legislation in the 1960s. Um, and that's where we're going to leave off. Um, we will revisit this, obviously, when we get to um, the 1960s. 
So it's very important that you understand um, what reconstruction does, what reconstruction doesn't do, um, which lead into the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Um, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Have a great day.